Ah, uh, much better. Okay, so I'm delighted to introduce Gary Marcus from NYU and formerly from Geometric Intelligence. Okay, Gary. Thank you all. So the session is called Kinds of Intelligence. I thought I would uh, emphasize the innate part, which uh, Josh at least introduced a little bit. Um, I should say I agree with almost everything that Josh said. We can say it to the uh, panel and the parts that we don't uh, agree on. Uh, this talk is really going to be a reply to Dennis. I rewrote my entire talk this morning, and in every slide that I wrote, I thought the chess paper was so cool that it deserved a reply. And having seen him even give some stuff that wasn't in the uh, paper about the positional play and so forth, I'm even more a fan of that paper. But I still think there's some other things that we need to talk about. Um, I'm going to dedicate this talk uh, to the memory of Jerry Fodor. I don't know how many people in this room know him, um, but you all should. He was, I think, one of the best philosophers of mine um, of the 20th century. Um, you should know about his book, The Modularity of Mind, which introduced a hypothesis that's kind of at the opposite extreme of end-to-end -end deep learning, and I think people like to know his arguments, um, whether they agree with him or not. He had another book called The Language of Thought, which is, I think, even more influential than what I want to say today. Basically, what he argued in that book is that we have something like a first order logic built into the head, and that that allows us to do a whole bunch of other things. So it was a strong nativist claim about the expressive power of something called mental ease. I'm not going to defend everything that Fodor said, but I'm going to take a sort of, I guess, Fedorian um, perspective. Yeah, to do that, I think, is a little bit ostensibly crazy, um, because everything that we've seen in recent AI research suggests that Fodor was wrong, that we don't need a whole lot of innate structure and look how far we can get, or at least that's kind of the, the thrust, I think, of what Dennis has talked about. We have some Gary Marcus caveats in there for my benefit towards the end. Um, nonetheless, even though this is maybe an unpopular position and even looks kind of crazy, I think it's still roughly right. So look, narrow AI has never been better, and, and the best evidence for that was, was um, given by Dennis just an hour ago uh, on this stage, and it includes um, this wonderful series of papers um, that we'll call Alpha Star. Um, and so that's the, the original Go paper, the most recent one that, that is applied to chess as well. And the one that kind of bothered me, which is the one in between, which is the Nature paper a month ago, which is the fourth uh, Nature paper coming out of DeepMind, if you keep me track. Um, and what bothered me about this paper was the title and the abstract and the way that it was framed. Not the results, which I thought were brilliant, and who knew we'd see even more brilliant results a month later. Um, so the title says, Mastering the, the Game of Go Without Human Knowledge. And I'm not sure that that's actually what took place. Dennis on his slide had, um, quote, zero knowledge. I think he must have put the quote marks around for my benefit, but he never explained. I don't see him in the ground. Um, he never explained what he, he meant by, by the quote zero. But I think it's not quite zero. And I think that understanding the difference between zero knowledge and quote zero knowledge is pretty important to understanding where we might be going towards AGI. And that's kind of what the, the talks can be about. So cognition could be viewed as basically a three-place function. Um, where the function is from innate algorithms, innate knowledge, and experience to whatever it is that you've got in cognition. Um, DeepMind has shown very convincingly that it is possible to attain outstanding cognitive performance in some domains with values of k that approach zero. I don't think it's literally zero, as I've already told you. The question today is, is that observation true for cognition in general? That's really what I want to understand. Um, so alpha is not really zero. Um, the most important thing, which Dennis acknowledged, is that Monte Carlo tree search is built in. And I don't see how you can say there's no human knowledge when you build in Monte Carlo tree search, which people have realized for the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, is essential for playing uh, games of this sort. So it was human knowledge that went into doing that. I don't think it was a kind of exhaustive parallel search of all possible models, and it just happened to come out that Monte Carlo tree search worked, although at least in principle you could imagine that given infinite computation. Um, still, they have been able to eliminate a lot of the innate structure um, that one might have imagined, and, and that um, piece on um, that stockfish and listing all of the algorithms that, that are in all the innate knowledge there, the Dennis presented is very compelling. They've really gotten rid of a lot of stuff. But I do want to point out that Monte Carlo tree search starts with the ability to represent trees, and that's actually what those of us on the native side of the spectrum have been arguing about most bitterly for a very long time is that you need to have trees in your innate argumentarium in order to do cognition. So Chomsky made that argument, um, Fodor made that argument, Pinker made that argument, I made that argument in my 2001 book, The Other Great Mind. Um, so you have innate stuff in AlphaGo, AlphaZero, et cetera, um, including all the hyperparameters that are a result of a long search, and including Monte Carlo tree search. If you read the paper naively, you might think, oh, it's just reinforcement learning, and that 
is where everything comes from. But they've not actually shown that reinforcement learning could itself derive tree search, let alone Monte Carlo tree search with the right kind of properties, or for that matter, the specifics of the architecture, like how many convolutions we want and where and so forth. That would be very impressive, but it's not actually what happened yet. Um, what DeepMind has done is to greatly reduce the amount of domain-specific knowledge just over the last year that they required. So on the left, where all of these kind of things that look like hacks in the first um, edition of um, AlphaGo, um, things like how many stones or how many liberties a particular stone had, and there was some symbolic computational algorithm off stage it was figuring out all this stuff. There was no learning involved there. It was just built in. It was a little bit weird. Like, um, you know, Josh and I are interested in this cell piece, the eightness hypothesis about, like, maybe we have a notion of an object in David. But nobody thinks we have innately the number of liberties that the stone has in a go position, right? I mean, it's only 3,000 years of go rules, which is a long time and not enough to live all of that. Um, so that was a bit of an embarrassment, I think. And, and very successfully, Demis got his troops to reduce that. Most of that is gone. I still think we should pay attention to what's left. So, and we should actually compare it to other endeavors by DeepMind, in fact, other famous endeavors. So the only innate knowledge now is the game rules in innate representational formats. There's no innate, no uh, opening knowledge, no innate tactics, like a knight fork, something I got off, cut off my slide, and so forth. Um, but still, the game rules and the rep representational formats are, again, that kind of funny innate stuff that we don't think are involved. So there's an innate claim for castling with respect to this model. Um, and you might think, well, of course, everybody needs to do that. But they didn't need to do that for the Atari game system. And it's worth the kind of comparing the two. So the Atari game system, the inputs were pixels. We haven't seen Alpha uh, Go or Alpha in any of its editions actually play just with pixels, which I think would be a more impressive demonstration. Although I think it's already very impressive. Okay, now I want to point out at this point that domain specificity and innateness often travel together, but they're not the same thing. So you can have things that are innate um, and domain specific, you can have things that are domain specific and not innate, for example. So chess is domain specific, but nobody thinks chess is innate. <laughs> might rely on some innate prerequisites about visualization and computation, but it's not innate. The patellar reflex is completely domain specific, it's entirely innate. Face recognition is mostly domain specific, but you can adapt it to recognize cars. There are all kinds of possibilities here. We have to be careful about, are we arguing about domain specificity or innateness? Um, so alpha zero occupies a particular point in the space of innateness and domain specificity, um, which is you've got innate machinery for uh, reinforcement learning, Monte Carlo tree search, massive computation, these innately wired rules and representational schemes that are specific to chess or to go, and you have the self-play academy, which is kind of, I think, of the like Russian chess academy. So that's also kind of sitting um, off stage, but th then there's no innate knowledge about specific board positions. Stockfish, and then as you displayed this beautifully, I wish I had this slide, um, is much more com complex innate structure, much more knowledge about um, board positions. They're just different positions in a space that you can imagine of possible architectures. It's really you know, um, many dimensional space. Alpha zero is much cleaner, it plays much better. That's an empirical discovery and it's pretty interesting. And it's an open question, as I'm saying, about whether the rules and domain specific representational schemes could be eliminated as they were in the Atari game system. Could you really do it from pixels? So there's a result here, it's a scientific result, um, which is that in the regime of perfect information war games, which is what we now know this algorithm will work on, um, provided that experience is essentially unlimited, you can be successful where K constitutes only rules and board representations that have been structured by human programmers and essentially nothing else on the knowledge front. And then you have the A just equals reinforcement learning about the Carlo tree search and empirically derived hyperparameter. So it's pretty far to the, I don't know, the left end of the spectrum of how much innate stuff you have in that regime. The question is, what if you move from that regime? Do you need to move from that regime? Could be that all the space of AI problems are just like these, that we could use exactly the same solution for everything we need to do in AI, and then we're done. Um, some of the media has you know, reported that alpha, um, alpha zero, I'm getting confused on my models here, um, as if that might be the case. Them it certainly did not. Um, so the key question, as I said, is does this hold more broadly for general intelligence? So that raises the question of what we mean by intelligence. So I, I'm going to quote from Demis's co-founder, Shane Legg, um, one of the many definitions we could use. Intelligence is a property of an agent that interacts with its environment so as to successfully achieve goals across a wide range of environments. Um, now the thing is, Go is not the same thing as life. So Go is highly complex. It gives perfect information about the board state. Um, it can be simulated perfectly. There's unlimited data. All that matters is the board state. Life is not like that. Life shares that complexity, but it's imperfect information. It can't be simulated perfectly. There's modest amounts of data per task. And essentially, anything can matter, which is something that Fodor actually talked about at the end of Modularity of Mind. People always think of 
that book is being about modules, but the crowning chapter of it was about what he called climate and isotropic knowledge, which is basically that anything could influence anything in semiconductor processing. So some hallmarks of human-like AGI are the ability to transfer between similar problems, to learn from verbal explanation, to learn from relatively small numbers of examples. Dan has touched on some of these. The ability to work with imperfect information and complete information, to work on a lot of information on the fly and all the way of this. Um, Ernie Davis and I have stressed this in terms of common sense knowledge. So for example, if you were a robot sitting on a tree with a chainsaw, you should try to make sure you're on the right side of the tree and not the wrong side of the tree. We didn't actually make up this example. The people who did the cover did that. That was so great. Um, you don't want to learn that through many trials of reinforcement learning. And, you know, that below you. An example that we did actually have in the paper is if I have a spider in a closed container and I shake it up, is the spider going to be able to get out? And you can do that. You don't need to do a full physics engine knowing where every molecule is in the container is. And you can do that for a whole bunch of containers that you've never seen before that have different kinds of shapes and some of them are broken and some are not. And you can easily make these kinds of inferences. Um, and you can figure out that the spider will escape from the right but not the left, etc., etc. I can show you this weird thing which turns out to be called a yarn feeder or something like that. And once I show you one of them and you kind of get the general idea from that little data, I can show you another one that's a whole lot uglier but you still understand um, what it does. So these are, these are some illustrations of kind of flexibility, common sense. There's lots of places, I think, where we would actually like to have AGI. So one is domestic robots. If I tell the robot to put the, the spider in a container, I'd like it to put in a container that is solid and not, not uh, otherwise, and you know, also that relates to theory of mind stuff that Josh was talking about. Medicine, science, there are lots of places. Complex real-world problems, um, maybe including driving, um, conversational interface, all kinds of things. Where it would be great if we could do some of these kinds of things that the human general intelligence could do. Um, we don't know whether those can be mastered by self-play and massive data sets, but I'm going to guess we're not. So why. The second, here's just a few very quick examples. So we would like AI to help us better with understanding um, gene transcription for all kinds of medical reasons. We would like, or at least those of us who, who do neuroscience, would really love AI to help us to figure out how the brain actually works, because the circuitry is way too complicated for any individual scientist to understand. We would like to understand even what one synapse does. There are hundreds of proteins in an individual synapse. Terry and I think that that's really important to neural computation. We don't know exactly how. Maybe we can't figure it out because our brains, no offense to Terry, but I'll take the offense to myself. My brain, anyway, is not big enough to put all of that stuff together. So I love AGI helping with that. And then there's this. I don't even know if in the front row you can see it, but this is a map of human facts. I will zoom in. It's Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin and the semantic network of the connections between them. It's already out of date, but it was made in November 2017. If you'd like to read some kind of conclusion about what all of that means, I don't know what the conclusion might be. Um, somebody who would like to solve a puzzle. So, I see we have a few Republicans in the crowd. So, <laughs> um, the question is, will what DeepMind discovered about board games transfer to other kinds of tasks? So, so far, as far as I know, Alpha Zero um, and its predecessors haven't been tested on things like games of imperfect information, games in which the only input was pixels, like in the Atari work, open-ended real-world tasks, knowledge integration, any sort of transfer, even to like a board of a different size. Um, and we also don't know if it's what cognitive psychologists would call saving. So if I teach you chess, will that help you with showing? As far as I know, none of this has been tested. As an aside, if there are successes or failures on other tasks, I hope you'll tell us about them. It would be great if we could play around with it, because it's obviously a very interesting piece of AI. All right, but here's some suggestive evidence for why I'm skeptical. So the first is that AlphaZero's nearest proxies have struggled with transfer. So um, uh, the nearest proxy that I'm going to talk about, of course, is the Atari game system, which is also the deep reinforcement learning system. Um, with slightly different properties. Um, at Geometric, Jupiter uh, and I supervised a team that put together um, some tests of how robust the, the learning was. Um, so we built our own 3D video game. We applied um, A3C, um, which you might develop to it, and it looks like, wow, we can learn to navigate a three-dimensional world. And then we just played mean games, like we moved the pylons around, and suddenly um, uh, A3C did a lot worse. We should have published that, but we didn't. We were busy. Um, <laughs> Um, but Vicarious did publish essentially the same thing um, this year. They did much better than we did much um, more versatile. They showed, like, if you just change, you know, so you have only one alien in Space Invaders, or, or you move where um, the earlier part of the video was talking through, um, if you move um, where the paddle is, then, then the system breaks down. And Peter Reveal and Ian Goodfellow and some others had a paper on, um, if you know carefully, Zubin and Gary's birthday. Um, uh, earlier this year, um, in which they showed all kinds of adversarial attacks. 
the stuff is not robust. It's not really representing where a pathway is or where the pylons are or things like that. Um, second thing is that DeepMind's efforts to learn more complicated open-ended problems like language from 3D worlds have not been nearly as impressive as their efforts to learn board games. So it's the same 700 person crew or whatever they have at DeepMind working on these kinds of things. So in 3D worlds and, and you have reinforcement learning, kind of similar, conceptually similar kinds of models. Find the blue object that's next to the green object, and you get some results. Like the system does learn the training set, but if you look at the x axis, it's like hundreds of thousands or millions of training episodes. And what the cognitive development literature tells us is kids can learn the meaning of a word, or at least part of the meaning of a word, in one trial. So there's no claim there that it's better than humans. It's nowhere near as good as humans. Um, they didn't publish this in the paper, but somebody spoke about it at NYU, and, and I took a uh, screenshot so you can see the kind of I was sitting inside. Um, and um, these data, which are not recorded in the paper, show that on negation, which is an example of something um, that linguists worry about, the system couldn't do it at all. So you got to more subtle syntactic and, and semantic phenomena couldn't do it at all. Um, I was just meeting with Peter Voss yesterday, who was an um, AGI company, he gave me this great slide, I know you can't see it, but all of these kind of conceptually difficult things in language, they're sort of at the level of negation. And we don't have a solution in the machine learning domain, I think, for any of them yet. Um, the third is that DeepMind is not alone in these struggles, and I'm not trying to pick on DeepMind, I think we're doing some of the best work in the field, but it's true in the field in general that when we look at open-ended problems, neural networks often break down in dramatic ways. So, Here's captioning, for example. This is a paper from um, elsewhere in Google. Um, it looks great on some of the examples. So you, you feed in the picture, and out from the model comes a caption. A group of young people playing a game of Frisbee, or a person riding on a motorcycle on a dirt road. But when you go out into the long tail, I think we have less data, things look really bad. So this one makes me think of Oliver Sacks, because it's a Parkinson with stickers, but the system says it's a refrigerator filled with lots of things. <laughs> Young McLuhan always likes to tell me these are like human optical illusions. I think they're like human hallucinations. <laughs> Um, this one just came out of MIT. It's a 3D printed um, uh, turtle that gets misidentified as a rifle for anybody who's worried about, worrying about autonomous weapons. I mean, it was designed as a turtle, but it should still make you very, very worried um, about people learning powering uh, drones. Um, so look, in a regime of perfect uh, information board games, you know, we have this stunning result. But my speculation is in more open-ended worlds, the text is not very read, in more open-ended worlds, the amount of machinery, A and K, the amount of innate machinery, A plus K, is going to go up. There's just no way um, for it to go down, and it's going to need to go up in order to account for the kind of phenomenon that Josh and I have been talking about. So what other innate structure might we need? Well, Josh and I are both huge fans of the spell figures. Here's one line um, from a paper in Cognition, 1994. If children are endowed in eaten with abilities to perceive objects, persons, and sets and places, then they can use their perceptual experience to learn about the properties and behaviors of such entities. And then she makes a learnability argument like Chomsky makes for language, basically saying, if you don't start with those things, you're not going to be able to learn the right thing. You're not going to be able to pick out the right things. And I think the failures of A3C and TQN to generalize to pylons in different places or paddles in different places is because they don't know what objects are. And so they don't have the right data set to make the right generalizations. Um, this is a, a slide from a debate that I had with Jan Lacoon, which you can see at tinyurl slash Lacoon Marcus debate um, about a month ago. Um, and I made a claim that the 10 things that are so on the right end of this slide were the minimal innate basis. I, I don't want to say it's exactly, but like roughly the minimal basis, um, innate basis out of which we might actually build AGI machines. Jan, to his credit, um, didn't say, yeah, maybe it's seven, and try to play the Wheel of Fortune game, you know, or whatever it is, Price is Right game, um, being the closest without going over. He said he didn't think any of them are next. So there's a clear uh, difference between Jan and me, um, including translation invariance, um, which, which is, I'm sort of saying my own joke here, but um, which is developed by Jan. So he didn't think any of these things were next. Um, the, this list is basically the union of the kinds of things that Spelke talks about, or sampler. Uh, the kind of things as well he talks about, like representations of objects, spatial temporal continuity, and the things that I argued for in my 2001 book that was inspired in part by Fodor's um, language of thought, where I argued that we need things like structured algebraic representations, operations over variables, type token distinctions. I will talk about those in more detail um, in the talk that I give on Saturday. So this is a possible list of innate things. Curiously, they they match roughly with my uh, collaborator, Ernie Davis, figured that we needed to do some common sense reasoning about containers. I know the, the font's really small, but you can read it in the AI journal um, a couple months ago. So the important thing is that there were, there were lots of logical propositions as the way that we developed it, um, or he developed it, um, for time, space, manipulation, history, for rigid objects, and so forth. It kind of converges on the stuff that Spelke thought about independently. 
Um, oops, don't need that anymore. Um, what, what we really need, um, I think, are systematic, thoughtful analyses of how to integrate a machine learning with machine learning. Um, the most thoughtful example I know of this is actually from Young. So in an early paper from Young and um, he compared five different visual systems. The one on the top was just a simple two-layer perception, and then there was a multi-layer perception. And by the end of his exercise, he got to convolutional um, networks, which of course we all use all the time now, um, even me. Um, and the result that he found was as you added more innate structure, the system worked better as a reference. Um, so more innate structure empirically made the system work better. Yes, we can do the thing that DeepMind is doing of factoring things out and trying to get rid of the part that we don't need, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't still be looking for stuff. So you could actually sort of have empty half full in, I guess. You could look at what, what DeepMind has done and say, well, this is actually evidence that what we really need is Monte Carlo tree search, and that's the first thing on our list of innate structures that we need, and maybe we need some more too. It turns out we don't need to innate and know about night forks. So we can sort of, um, in checks, so we can sort of try to work both ways and figure out the innate structure. There is actually already a lot of innateness in every neural network. So how many layers, when you build a neural network, that's an innate commitment. How many, what types of layers, how many um, units, whether or not to have Monte Carlo tree search, what the out output activity function should be, um, wh what the input units should stand for, and as I pointed out, that's very different in the AlphaGo systems than it is in the Atari game systems. There's teacher design, you know, even more complicated in AlphaZero than it is in the Atari game system. So there's actually lots of innate um, choices, but I'm with Josh in thinking that we should be looking at cognitive development as a suggestion for where to get them, instead of just doing it purely bottom up from what widgets can we manipulate. Um, which reminds me of this XKCD cartoon you probably all saw it recently. Somebody says, this is your machine learning system, and the other guy says, yeah, yeah you just pour in the data into this big pile of linear algebra and you collect the answers on the other side. And the first person says, well, what if the answers are wrong? And the second says, well, you just stir in the pile until they start looking right. Well, the stirring the pile is playing around mostly with the stuff over here, but the other option, uh, these are my kids over here, um, is to try to think about the representations and primitives that might be built into the minds of small children of course, Allison's pushing the same direction as less native than Josh, um, or maybe equally. I actually wanted to ask if I was raising up there about that question. Um, but the, maybe we should be looking at the representations of primitives that are built in uh, to, uh, about objects, agents, and so forth in the minds of the child. So, conclusions, do I have like three more minutes? Um, one lesson of, of DeepMind's research program is that RL and tree structure, plus minimal knowledge, works in means of perfect information. But as near as I can surmise, that's not going to get us to AGI. The second lesson from their research program is that even in games of perfect information, some innate structure is still indispensable, like representations of trees um, and, and the Monte Carlo tree search that operates over them. Other domains may need more innate structure. My work and Spelkies and others offer some suggestions about where we might look. I think the lesson from Jan's original work, we get to discuss that a little bit better on convolution, is we can build more innate structure if you want to. What I should have said there about Jan's stuff is it's a really beautiful way. Convolution is a really beautiful way of building what vision scientists have known all along what we need, which is spatial invariance. And so you have an idea from cognition that it can map onto a uh, way of representing things within a neural network framework. I think we need more work like that to say, how do you represent if you're going to stick with the neural network framework, how do you represent an object and reason over the spatial temporal continuity over that object and so forth? I think whether or not we're going to get to AGI may depend on whether we have the will to build in that innate stuff. David Chalmers, when we had this debate, um, Don McCune and I, said, I did it. He texted us. He said, I did a Google search um, for nativism in AI and got a did you mean error. And I think that's symptomatic of the fact that the field's not even thinking that much about whether there should be innate stuff, because there's such a strong bias in the direction that Dennis is pushing today to try to factor it all out. And I'm not sure that's the right way to go. So what kinds of intelligence do we need? For AGI, we need the sort of intelligence that can think flexibly about time, space, agents, causes, objects, and so forth. And for that, we may need the kinds of things I was advocating in my 2001 book, The Algebraic Mind, which include operations over variable structured representations, distinctions with distinctions between types and tokens, and so forth. I don't think the success on Go or chess shows otherwise at all. And one last thing, life is not a Kaggle competition. I assume almost everybody in this room knows what a Kaggle competition is. Well, it's great if you can have a prepackaged data set in which you can map inputs from outputs in large training sets with a reasonable expectation that the test data are drawn from the same distribution as the training data, and everything you need is encapsulated in that directory that you can download from Kaggle. I don't think life is like that at all. Life is the training set. Nothing 
It is neatly packaged. There's no guarantee that your next challenge is going to be the same as yesterday's challenge. You don't want to just be fitting the existing task. You want to be building reusable skills and knowledge that can apply to novel challenges. So if I have a lesson, uh, or a moral for the, the young people that's here, that are here, I would say it's this. The challenge of reusability of how I get stuff that I know here to be used anywhere else is the real challenge that the field should be focusing on. I thank you very much.